Hello, welcome to the LaRouche Pack Weekly Report for March the 2nd, 2011. I'm John Hopeful, and with me in the studio today are Matthew Ogden of LPAC TV and Lyndon LaRouche. So, Lynn, you want to talk about strikes today? Well, more than that, we have, uh, we have a mass strike. It's in process internationally. The mass, this mass strike is actually a signal of the countdown for the collapse of the world system, the world monetary financial system, which is in progress right now. The characteristic of the mass strike is something that most people have no idea of what it is or how it works. It, the phenomenon was first diagnosed by uh, back in the beginning of the century, uh, and uh, it is still not fully understood. A mass strike is an uproar in the population or a section of the population which is spontaneous. It's not orchestrated by anyone. It's not a planned strike. It's not like a trade union strike or a similar kind of strike, protest strike, organized. It's a spontaneous reaction within a population. Now, what we have internationally, you have somewhere between the ages of 20, uh, 25 and up to 45, but with a core between 30 and 40. And what we're seeing around the world is a true mass strike, which is concentrated so far in the transatlantic region, it has not yet shown up in the Pacific region. Uh, this is typified, uh, for example, by what's happening in Wisconsin. Uh, but it's also typified by what is going to go on in other places, as in Europe. For example, we had a, a, a strike which got rid of a guy called Guttenberg in the German system, who was the temporary defense minister. And it was discovered that he had uh, obtained his doctorate by fraud. That, um, so what happened, you had, a, you had the Bill Zeitung and so forth was defending Guttenberg. And the chancellor was defending him in his position, despite the criticism. But then you had the professionals, the people with doctor's degrees, as professors and so forth, came up, had an uproar, and demanded the guy be removed because what they could expose that he had done as corruption was contemptible. That was their argument. And so you had a mass strike, in a sense, phenomenon there. You have mass strikes which are always uh, tending to burst out in France right now. You have phenomena in this direction in, in Germany. You've had it in Bahrain. You had it in Egypt. You had it in Tunis. You have it in Wisconsin. You have it also in other parts of the West, Western states apart from Wisconsin. So this is a spontaneous phenomenon which is when the people have had it, especially a certain generation of the people. And what we're seeing now lies largely between, there are some younger people involved, but is, is the center of it, the, the sponsor of it, is essentially between the age of about 25 and 45. And you see that pattern around the world. Now it's building up. It's building up, especially in the transatlantic region. And it's, it's not organized by anybody. It's self-organized. It's, it was organized by the enemies of humanity, in effect. <laughs> but who's responding? You find the, the members of the Congress, uh, particularly the Senate and House of Representatives, who are generally between actually co coming into the uh, 40 to 50, 60 year age group. Hmm? You want to see them, they're like dead meat sitting there right now. They're doing nothing. They're doing nothing to defend themselves. They're doing nothing to defend the nation. They're just going along with what the Republican Party and, and, and the Democrats, uh, the president is going along with. The president is not really involved. The president is divorced from reality now. He's go making gestures as if he were the boss, but there's something else as the boss now. And what you have is a reaction against this, as you see most famously now in Wisconsin which is a true mass strike phenomenon. Now what this, the, what you're looking at the press, international press, Europe and the United States, they're lying about this phenomenon. Uh, they're pretending that, well, here's the situation in Egypt. They're, they didn't like Mubarak. That's not the issue. What happened in Tunis? Same thing, it's not the issue. What's happened in Bahrain? Same thing, not the issue. What's happening in Wisconsin? Same thing, not the issue. 
In other words, you have this jerk in Wisconsin, the governor, who's pretending, well, I got the majority of the vote. Well, he hasn't got the majority of the vote. They discovered what he was, and he hasn't got it anymore. He's still elected or erected or whatever he is. But he, he's doomed. This guy is doomed. A mass strike movement like this, which is a spontaneous phenomenon, is not something you can control by the ordinary mechanisms. Now, at the other side, you have to look at what's, what is the cause of this. It's not a, a provocation of a very specific type. It's not like an ordinary strike or a protest movement of the ordinary type. This is a spontaneous development. It, it's like a, a process, which is like a weather change, which you don't control. You react to the weather. So this is like a weather-like phenomenon. And it's spreading around the world, especially in the transatlantic region and especially in the north transatlantic region right now. It will not be confined to that. It will hit, it will hit India, one of the vulnerable places for a spread of this right now. And so, and what you have is people who are in government and people, the press are lying. They're saying, well, this is the issue in, 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 uh, in Egypt. This was the issue in Libya. Bunk! This was the issue in Tunis. Bunk! This is the issue in Wisconsin. Bunk! The people in the whole transatlantic region are smelling a collapse of civilization. And especially between the ages of about, well, yeah, I would say you go down to about 25, up to about 45, where you'll get the core of this motion. Uh, oh, the older generation, older age group, they're inert. They still don't know what time it is. But this group, which is, is like, uh, like a weather symptom, the weather has changed, mm -hmm. uh, and the mass strike is on. So we have a situation in which the entire world financial monetary system, especially the transatlantic region now, is going down. We're on a very short fuse. This entire system is going down. I mean, anybody who says they're campaigning for an election in the year 2012, they have to be clinically insane. They should be removed from government on grounds of insanity. There's not going to be an election in 2012 the way things are going now. The system is going to disintegrate before the end of this year. You look at the rate of inflation. Look at the rate of food shortages and inflation. This is going to be a big one, and it is a big one already. The food shortage is a big factor in the mass strike. It's what people are responding to. It's like bad weather. The storms come in bad weather. And the bad weather are all these conditions which have convinced a section of society that the situation as it stands, is hopeless. And what they've got to do is get rid of whoever is in power. Because whoever in power is in power, who isn't doing something about this, has to be thrown out. And you're going to see this Scott Walker phenomenon. This guy, this guy is the greatest fool you could imagine. He makes Louis XVI look like a really insightful creature. <laughs> um, here he is. Here. Yeah, he's governor of Wisconsin. But he's doomed. He should be actually taking a plane or looking for a spaceship to get the hell out of town if you, want, if you knew what's good for him. So that's the kind of phenomenon we're dealing with. Is there are processes in society which are poorly understood, though they are sometimes identified as the mass strike phenomenon has been identified as a clinical phenomenon. This clinical phenomenon is what's moving people. Uh, you get for now. You get another symptom in this. Let's take teachers. In the state of Wisconsin, the teacher phenomenon is crucial. It was the area that responded the most. There were a number of categories which Scott Walker was raping. A number of people he was raping, in effect, or murdering. He probably didn't get around to murder yet. He got raped first. And who's responding? Well, the, the core of the response is teachers. And what you have is that a supplementary phenomenon is students of teachers. So the students are in there supporting the teachers. Now, what's this about teachers? You find the trade unions are dead. The trade unions are not really a significant social phenomenon right now. They are kissing butt. And they're opportunists. They have no sense of reality. They've lost it. They've caved in. But the teachers and the teachers' unions, well, what's the difference? We had this discussion of this. 
the key, the key thing about teachers is teachers care about their students, as very few other patients, every other categories do. The teachers' unions have often been the leaders in resistance against repression, the ec economic repression and abuse and so forth, because they care about children. They care about the students. They care about their welfare. Teachers will often uh, sacrifice their own funds and so forth to help service their students and protect them. Hmm? The thing we've been discussing, the teacher phenomenon here is very important. And teachers are important because they care about the minds of the students. As other professions have lost that connection of responsibility for their constituency. And this has been a long story about the history of teachers and teachers' unions and teachers' organizations. Their concern for the students. You see that even on universities, which you would think are improbable, with the improbable professors on some of these universities. But you'll see even they, even at that level, opportunists as they tend to become in this ripe days of rivalry in academia, but they still, are, still attach themselves to the service of the students even on that level. And that's what we have to understand. That, and also, the phenomena of the crash are, is accelerating. You look at the rise in the rate of prices. Look at the rate of the rise in food shortages, acute food so shortages, well, the resentment against that. So what you have now is you have a process which is prepared, even though it's not really conscious of this. But for those of us who understand this process, you're looking at doomsday for whole governments around the world. What you've seen in Libya, what you've seen in Egypt, what you've seen in Tunis, what you've seen in Bahrain, what you're seeing in Wisconsin, what you're seeing spreading into Ohio, what you're seeing in Indiana, is doomsday for this present U.S. government. It doesn't mean the government as a constitutional institution will cease to exist. It means that there's going to be a purge, a big popular purge of the systems of state and federal government, especially the federal government. But now because the states are being the opportunists with the Republican factor in the state level, the reaction is coming against the state governments. And the people are going to become increasingly merciless toward the behavior of state governments which are acting like Scott Walker or anyone like him or, Chris, or Christie in, in New Jersey. Their time is about gone. They think they're on the uptick for power. They're on the downtick for the garbage pail, politically. <laughs> and that's the phenomenon we have to see. People uh, have been so long using polls, statistical polls and so forth, to try to understand trends and behavior in the American population, the European population. That's nonsense. In this situation, that does not work. When you have a mass strike phenomenon, you can have, it can go bad, too. One of the cases, for example, the French Revolution, was a mass strike phenomenon which went bad because the French government re successfully resisted the mass strike, huh? and the British uh, Foreign Office, which was orchestrating the French Revolution, as, uh, uh, under Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy Bentham was the guy who was orchestrating the French Revolution. Bentham was able to control the process and turn the revolution into a terror, one of the most hideous terrors. As a matter of fact, the, the birth of modern fascism, as we call it fascism, was actually the French Revolution because, because the French institutions failed to support the people when the people were in a, a dire uh, situation, a dire stress situation. Then the British agents were able to orchestrate events to turn the mass strike process into a nightmare. And out of this nightmare came eventually Napoleon, who was nothing but a useless puppet of both the British Foreign Office and, and, uh, the, uh, and, and Vienna. So they orchestrated a mass war in Europe, the Napoleonic Wars, and the Napoleonic Wars did one thing. They destroyed the nations of continental Europe and thus cleared the way for the consolidation of the power of the British Empire. And that's why they continued. The, that's why the war was continued by Napoleon. Napoleon had originally been an asset of a different French party. Then he lost his butt in Egypt, 
and he went back and he dumped his wife, who had been a part of the supporting of the uh, Turkish faction, the Ottoman faction, against the Austrians. And he changed his luck by dumping his wife and getting a new wife, who was a Habsburg wife, a Habsburg princess. And from that point on, Napoleon Bonaparte was a stooge for the Habsburg princesses. <laughs> princess, princesses. <laughs> and they played him out to the end. And then they dumped him. And then the British and the Habsburgs cut, divvied up Europe. And this was the situation in which this de practically destroyed the United States at that point. People in our own country went berserk. Jefferson went absolutely insane. Other people went insane because of the, what happened to the United States under these conditions of the approach of the French Revolution and its outcome. Because the great alliance in which we'd, our freedom had been based, what France, the King of France, the King of Spain, the uh, League of Armed Neutrality, headed by the Tsarina of Russia, these were forces which had supported us in our struggle for independence. These forces were dissipated by this process in Europe, which was a British, <coughs> British intelligence operation. But Jerry Bent Bentham was key in this operation. So if we don't, when you've got a mass strike like this movement, which we're having now, which is coming on, if the nation state system does not respond to the demands of the mass strike movement, the mass strike will turn into an obscene mass a seething, obscene mass, which would be the end of civilization for a long time to come. So therefore, we better listen to the mass strike voices now while there's still time to do so. We, still ha we now have to offer real solutions. And the solution is obvious. And just think about what the issue is. Reality is that if the present process continues, if Obama stays in office, for example, the United States is finished this year. Hmm. There's not going to be a 2012 election. There may be a, a 2012 erection of a certain kind, but not an election. <clears throat> it's going to be held. So what's, what's the block? Well, the British are playing a, their puppet, Obama, but Obama's no longer in control of this thing. You have a, a fascist Republicans are in control of it, typified by Scott Walker, and Christie of New Jersey. These are the typical piggish characters who are the, th the greatest threat because they're the greatest provocateurs against the people. Visible. There'll be others coming along. And, and if we don't get rid of this problem, uh, we're not going to have a nation. And right now, as of now, don't think about Christmas time because that's the time it is not not. Santa Claus is going to be hanging on the tree, but a lot of politicians and a lot of other institutions. It's like the French Revolution. <clears throat> what we have to do is very elementary, but you have to think about what we're up against. The, the present world financial system is in a hyperinflationary breakdown crisis. It has not gone to the actual breakdown yet, but it's in a hyperinflationary breakdown crisis, which means an accelerating rate of inflation. The key to this thing is that inflationary drive is now connected to a food shortage internationally, a food shortage in the United States, a food shortage which is aggravated by the Greeny movement, by the so-called environmentalist movement, because the environmentalist movement is one of the great factors in causing the shortage of food. And the shortage of food is one of the breaking points in this process. So you have to get rid of that problem. You have to get rid of Obama, you have to get rid of the inflation, which we can do, and you have to do a Glass-Steagall reform. Without Glass-Steagall, there's no chance of saving the United States. Without Glass-Steagall and the United States going under, result, Europe is finished. Brazil is already finished. Brazil is, you know, Brazil is the dead end of a, of a scheme. So, and the so-called BRIC, which threatens the continued existence of Russia as a nation, because some forces in Russia have made the mistake of playing sucker game for a dead end, for a bad bank. Well, you have to think of the BRIC as a bad bank. A bad bank is a place where banks have a special bank and they dump all the losses into that special bank. The BRIC is a bad bank. 
any nation which is part of the BRIC is doomed financially to a financial collapse right now. And the bad bank of the BRIC is supposed to be the protective barrier to help what's left of the British assets. So, so therefore, we have to, what, put the entire system through a Glass-Steagall reform, initiated from the United States. That means get rid of Obama, because Obama will never tolerate a, a Glass-Steagall Act. Obama's a British agent, and the British agents have sent an order, no Glass-Steagall. And it was when the British sent the order to Obama, no Glass-Steagall, that the Glass-Steagall law, which was be, about to be enacted, before the last election, before the last election, was was cancelled. It was cancelled by the British through Obama and through complicit elements in the in the uh, legislature. US. So what you have to do is first of all you have to get rid of Obama. And that's easy. He's a mental case under uh, section four of Art the twenty fifth amendment to the Constitution. This guy is automatically out. And, well you get him out and what you would have left in the federal government, including a change in the presidents, who is the president at that time, you would actually have the freedom to make reform. But then what's your next obstacle? Well, it's the banking system. At present, the if we use a Glass-Steagall standard to measure what's legitimate debt and what isn't, the United States and Europe are both buried under illegitimate debt, totally illegitimate. Therefore, if you don't get rid of about 15 to 20 trillion dollars of waste paper, of phony money, of monopoly play money, debt, you will not have a United States. Now, if you cancel that, you're going to wipe out most of those financial institutions. What you will save, you will save institutions which correspond to commercial banks. You'll go into every bank, you take the element of the, of the bank, which is a legitimate commercial bank in its operations, you save that, the other parts of the bank, whoosh, whoosh, gone. Huh? Glass-Steagall reform. It's what Roosevelt did, essentially, on a, back in 1933. If we do that, then we have the means, through federal credit, of actually saving the viable banking system. Now let the others go to hell. We don't need Wall Street. We don't need London. We don't need these crooked banks in Europe. We don't need them. If they're wiped off the books with a total loss, that is not a calamity for us. The calamity would be not to do it, because not to do it would mean you would, the mass strike process would go into this ugly logic, the logic of a, a dark age. And so therefore, people who are sane are not thinking about 2012, not under the present president. They're thinking about getting rid of this present regime under this president, and not the similar things in Europe. Because the rate of inflation, which is now accelerating, combined with the shortage of food supplies, which is now accelerating, which is al already a key feature of the mass strike movement across the transatlantic region. If we don't, within the months ahead, and there are very few months, I fear, do make this reform, you're not going to have a United States and you're not going to have a Europe. And if Europe and the United States go down, then even Asia, such as China and India and so forth, will also go down. So we're now at a point where anybody who is actually competent and sane is going to go with a Glass-Steagall reform in the United States as a strictly 1933 Glass-Steagall law in order to wipe out the existence of Wall Street and similar kinds of afflictions. Huh? in order to get the federal government to do what Hamilton did to save the states before the formation of the U.S. Constitution. On that basis, the states will be protected by the federal government, which is the only place our Constitution allows for it to happen. Right? The, states will, the states will be saved by the federal government. The federal government will then take major projects, which are largely two major projects, which are on the books for us to do now. One is Nuampa. That's a fairly long-term project, but it means a, a project which will fairly quickly em employ four million people, let alone. We have other projects which are necessary to go with that, which coordinate with Nuampa, which is another, about 
maybe two and a half million people. So we can have a, a sudden surge of a Roosevelt-style recovery, but on a larger scale, to the combination of taking an area like New York State, Northern New Jersey, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, and out to St. Louis. Because that area is the machine tool sector, which the talent is largely inactive now. But we bring it back because people still have the skills. We're going to build railway systems and similar kinds of systems, high-speed systems, to support and coordinate with the market created by the Noapa project, which means that we will then be on the road to a Roosevelt-style long-term recovery. And our doing it will create the precedent for Europe to go in a similar direction. In that way, we can come out of that in the course of this year and into next if we, as a process. And then the mass strike will be very happy. And the mass strike will then convert itself into the mass base of support for this process. So that's a choice. We have the mass strike, which goes to a hell process like the French Revolution. The, the, are we going to a mass strike process which gets rid of Obama, passes Glass-Steagall, uses Glass-Steagall as a way of saving the states, getting the states back in shape, and secondly, to build the NOAPA project and the auxiliaries. We're on the road to a Roosevelt-style recovery. And it was a recovery which can spread across the Atlantic and can save civilization. Well, one of the benefits of doing just that is that you put an end to this imperial looting operation that goes under the euphemism of globalization. And we, we start bringing our manufacturing back to the United States. You start encouraging nations to become self-sufficient in the production of food. You know, you, you break up this whole game of making the world dependent upon these imperial cartels. And that gives you then the basis to, have, to actually have national sovereignty. Well, you've got to think of another factor, though, remember. The other factor is the British monarchy is committed to reducing the world's population from now in the order of 7 billion people to less than 2. That's the standing policy of the British monarchy. Now, this is not a new policy, really. It's new in that sense. But the policy has been as far as, as long, far back as we know in European civilization and adjoining Asian civilization. The policy has been what's called the oligarchical principle. Under the oligarchical principle, the idea is you take the majority of the population, you keep it stupid, don't let it have too much technological or scientific knowledge, and cut it down to portions you want. So that the oligarch, it's called the oligarchical system, the oligarchical principle, which is what this debates were in ancient Greek uh, culture were, the same thing. Therefore, the idea of reducing the population to a small and stupid layer by stupefying them, preventing them from having education, preventing them from having technological progress, like the ban on fire, you know? the idea that fire should not be available. What's fire? That's nuclear power today. That's thermonuclear power. That's today. They're saying no nuclear power. They're saying, well, let's have windmills. Well, windmills are the most useless kind of effort for power you can imagine. The, today, even with windmills highly priced under protectionist arrangements to keep them in place, a windmill, even at today's prices, which has a, the cost of putting it in place, the cost of operating it, the cost of taking it down when it's, when it's destroyed, it has to be removed. The windmills make no net income for the national economy. They are negative on the national economy. Same, solar collectors are worse. Solar collectors not only are vastly costly relative to other sources of power, but if you get a fire in, it, in your house and you have a solar collector on the roof, you better get to leave town because that thing is dangerous. A fire in a solar collector house... We, you put, try to put a drop of water on that thing, it's going to kill you because the accumulated electrical charge inside the, uh, uh, the solar collecting system will reach out and kill you. <laughs> if you take a hose to it, you're dead. So leave town. It's the best thing you can do. 
And they're also tremendously expensive. And also they're bad. Because solar collectors kill the possibility of green. Mm -hmm. Solar collectors take away the sunlight which is necessary for chlorophyll and for plant life. The solar collector is the best way to promote deserts. But these guys don't object to that because they want fewer people. Because if you have a larger population, like we have now, you have to have a level of technology which can sustain that population. If you have a level of technology under which it, you have to sustain that population, then the oligarchy loses power. Because if the people are required to use high technology and education, the people are no longer stupid. Look at the, what we have a generation, say, the past 10 years. Young people who are now under 25. Hmm? And just think about what kind of system they've lived under under the past 10 years in growing up. Maximum age, say, of the group, 25. 10 years since George W. Bush came, became president. We've gone to hell. Huh? So there we have now a young generation which has no, not only unemployment, but no notion of ever working. They don't believe in working. They don't believe in, in organized working. They're not employable. We would go on another 10 years, we'd be dead. Even five more years would be terrific. You can imagine people running around un, you know, 18 to 30 as a, as a percentile of the population which has no inclination to work, actually work, what kind of a nation do you have? Not only are we running out of time in terms of the financial crisis, we're running out of time in terms of a population factor, like the Tucson factor. This young kid, what was the problem? He belongs to that generation, now between the ages of 16 or so, or 18 or so, and 25. They have no inclination about reality to a reality because your work identity in society or the equivalent is your sense of identity. What's your usefulness in, in society? How can you walk the streets and say, I'm useful to society? If you're a member of this poor generation, like this poor kid, this poor lunatic from Tucson. So therefore, in order to avoid the Tucson factor and giving it another five years to cut into the total population, you would be getting to a hopeless situation inside the United States. So therefore, these reforms are absolutely indispensable if we're going to save civilization. You cannot really, and also there's another factor here. It's a, a, a science factor. There is no such thing as a, an even level of uh, productivity or even level of existence in technology. Mankind does not lose uh, resources needed to sustain mankind, even a growing population. It doesn't lose it. But what happens is we, we uh, find that we use up the richest resources as raw material type resources. And therefore, we have to increase the uh, energy flux density of our power sources to make up for this depletion of the so-called richest raw material sources. In other words, we, do, we never lose the raw materials, but they are dispersed in an inconvenient way for us. We solve the problem by increasing the energy flux density in production. More technology, higher energy flux density. In that way, we run ahead as with nuclear power and thermonuclear fusion. Without nuclear power and thermonuclear fusion, you cannot maintain even the present population of the United States. You cannot maintain on a planet basis, you can't maintain above you know, two to three uh, billion people. You can't do it. So therefore, you're talking about genocide. Zero growth, zero technological growth is genocide. And that's what the World Wildlife Fund, such as Prince Philip of England, means. So therefore, this is, a, this is the situation. We need, and we can do. We have the technologies or the basis of it. To go back to a full-blown high technology operation of the type parallel to what Roosevelt did in going and preparing for what became World War II. We have that capability. We still have it. 
But this means nuclear technology, it means thermonuclear technology, it means similar kinds of things. It means high industrial intensity, high agricultural intensity, modern technology, no, long, no so-called uh, minimal kind of, of, of effort. We can save civilization. The guys who have the other program are either idiots or fascists. So therefore, if we want to save humanity, we have to increase the energy flux density and the supply of high energy flux density motives. We have to create large-scale projects like NWAPA. We typified NWAPA. We have to create automatic rail systems, automatic levit uh, other kinds of systems at the same time. And this means going back to a high energy flux density economy. Both in agriculture, we're going to have to end the kind of agricultural policies that have been imposed upon us in the recent years. The Monsanto factor has to be eliminated. That Monsanto monopoly on grains should be destroyed by law because Monsanto did not invent life. If you have a seed which contains life, you have no right to claim that you, had control, you can control that market. In other words, what Monsanto will go in or complain if you have any seed they trace to in any part to their seed form, they will come in and have your farm taken down or take the crop taken away and bankrupt you. So therefore, if a farmer who actually did not take any of Monsanto's feed, but if a seed fell across in his land and it grew up and they found it, they're going to shut it down. Mon the Monsanto grift, as they best call it, should be canceled. It has to be canceled because it's humanly in unconstitutional. <laughs> so these are the kinds of things that we consider. We have to consider this is the now the process. What's the remedy? Remedy number one, we've got to go to a Glass-Steagall reform on a global scale. Yeah, that will work. We've got to have large projects which give us high technology employment. The NOAPA is the leader that is complemented for support of the NOAPA project by taking these states, which are the former industrial states, and putting them back to work because people live there who still have these kinds of skills. So bring it back there. We need these projects to help develop the NOAPA project. We need to go to a, a fixed exchange rate system again huh? in order to have uh, international trade on a, a sound basis. So these reforms are absolutely necessary uh, as well, in addition to canceling this great swindle which we're suffering under now. And so you have to think about the immediate thing, which I've specified here. Immediately, we must do the following. But we must also, at the same time, have a perspective on the employment and production perspectives for humanity. We've got to go from, away from a monetary system, a monetarist system, to a credit system, which is our constitutional system. One of our great levers is that our Constitution provides for an anti-monetarist system, a credit system. The monetarist system is an imperialist system. And there are a lot of things we have, good things we have to do, a lot of very good things, very nice things that we can be involved in. But we have to understand these kinds of factors. The, the mass strike movement, how are we going to respond to it? What's the immediate actions that have to be taken in the economy to start the economy? We start it again on the basis of reality of what we have now. And what is our longer-term perspective for humanity under these conditions? Uh, build back the space program immediately. If we can cancel Obama and put the space program back into war operation instead. <laughs> you know, um, I went back and reread the Defense of Poetry by Percy Shelley, just in the context of trying to understand this question of the metaphysics of the mass strike. And... Um, I mean, beyond just the conclusion paragraph, the, there were two other things that really stuck out to me, which I thought were very provocative. Uh, number one, he begins the entire essay by, by drawing this polemic between the senses and the imagination, what he calls the shadow and the substance. Mm -hmm. and I think that gets directly at some of these questions that we've been discussing in the basement about the, the domain beyond the five senses, which is operating in human society. Then the other thing, which I thought was very compelling, is in looking at the continuum of human history, this ongoing, unbroken chain of process, he compares it in terms of the connection between all of the minds of all of the individuals throughout the course of human history as if 
uh, he compares it to a magnetic field. I think he uses the words uh, invisible effluence that mm. is sent forth from one mind to another, which links these minds together. And I think though that's the that's that's the domain that exactly what we've been been now breaching in terms of the work that we're doing yeah. in the basement. Yeah, it is precisely that. But is, is the idea of I, I would you know I addressed that yesterday, remarks yesterday. But the point is, most people have a as the mass strike illustrates, fun of film illustrates, that we are so believing in our five senses, so-called, mm -hmm. that we don't realize that these five senses are nothing more than uh, like instruments we create, sense instruments we create. They do not show us reality, because reality for human beings, as opposed to, to anything else, as opposed to machines, uh, is based on the question of human creativity. And it has a lot of ramifications to it. So our senses are nothing more than instruments, like attachments. They are not us. They are instruments which come in the package with us. But they're not us. They're the instruments that come in the package. These instruments we use to, uh, as sense perception instruments, we use and we interpret what, these sense, what the combination of these senses do. We then, go, to go back to the mind, which is not sense perception, right? it's not a deductive calculator kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Go back to the mind. The mind now has to understand the process of human development, human intellectual development. That's the mind. That is the sense perception and the mind are not the same thing. This is something, of course, that Riemann makes clear, absolutely clear in the third section of his habilitation dissertation. But we have people out there who believe in sense perception. They believe in sense certainty. The senses do not tell us the truth. The tenses, senses give us an indication of a shadow of the truth. We sense our shadows. Now from the shadows, the mind must construct from a concatenation of conflicting shadows, must, must find a principle. You know? And that's, that is lost in our present educational system. We have, our university system, our educational system, is making people stupid because they rely on sense certainty and they believe that what they sense is what's there. What you sense are the shadows cast by reality. They are not the reality, they're the shadows. And the human mind's function is to enable us to adduce what the reality is that has cast the shadows. For example, the perfect example of this is Kepler's discovery of gravitation. And that is what every freak hates. Every freak in every science department who's a real freak hates Kepler. Because Kepler proved the process. What did Kepler do? He made two basic discoveries which are greatest significance. Number one, the question of defining the orbits of two planets, planetary systems, Mars and Earth. Shadow number one. A principle, the first discovery of, of what that shadow means. Second one, the calculation of universal gravitation. Again, two, a shadow, uh, which, uh, which Einstein recognized as that Kepler had proven the universe is finite but not bounded. In other words, there's no fence that contains the universe, or nothing the equivalent of a fence out there. The universe is unbounded, but it's finite. And when we look at things like the galactic functions that we're dealing with, it's, it becomes clearer, right. concretely clearer. And so therefore, the, this, the problem here is we are, we're not educating our people to real science. Real science is not mathematics. You will never get discovery out of mathematics. You use mathematics as a tool of discovery, hmm. but it is not the discovery instrument. As, as Riemann points out. But think of how many people who are professors and so forth of sciences who believe who are opposed to Kepler, to Kepler's discovery. They're intrinsically incompetent. Now, some of these guys I know are, are in, were competent in certain areas on this or that or this. But in the conception of how the universe is organized, they were not competent. Well, that's a big fight with them during the SDI operation. Yeah. Huh. Just exactly that. Now, so that's, that's our problem, is we are so oriented 
to the idea of sense certainty, to sense pleasure, the idea of the pleasure-pain principle, that we lose track of the fact that the human mind is not that of an animal. No, animals are creative. All animal species are creative. But they don't know what they're doing. They just do it. Huh? As you'll find ways most uh, sex maniacs are. They like that. They don't know what it is they're doing, but they just do it. Because, uh, uh, and, and we, we have not paid enough attention to what might be called the moral principle. And, and the moral principle of humanity, which is the creative powers of imagination as typified by Kepler's discovery of gravitation. And nobody else ever had discovered gravitation except Kepler. No one, except those who followed him. But they, people running around saying that they have, Newton did it. I'm a fig Newton. What are you gonna... <laughs> <laughs> He's a faker, a complete faker. Well, the other, uh, I mean, the other thing that we put out on this website just this week, I think, which is receiving a lot of attention, is the interview that um, Alicia Saratani and Sky Shields did. And it's a perfect insight into how you have the eruptions <coughs> of these mass strikes in two diametrically different sides of the planet Earth, which have no kinetic connection to each other necessarily, but the conditions are ripe for it. And it's exactly like the emergence of these different species which have the, the same type of characteristics, but they're from completely different so-called branches or in completely different places on the it's planet. It's the same thing as Hep Kepler's vicarious hypothesis. Uh -huh. It's the same thing, which comes actually from Plato. <laughs> it's great. Right. No, it's a good universe. We just have to know how, learn how to use it. Well, we've certainly got a lot of work to do. I mean, you have, you have Bernanke yesterday or the day before testifying before Congress saying that qualitative easing, that, that his whole bailout process is working, that the inflation in food prices and energy prices and oil prices and things are not a problem, that you know, we're still in the domain of, of deflation. How about, how about putting him in a cage and not feeding him? <laughs> And see what he has to say about that. Yeah. See what the experience teaches him. <laughs> <laughs> he would probably starve to death not understanding why he was wrong. You know, he probably would admire his, uh, he'd admire his conviction. Just like a man at life in prison, you know, admiring his conviction. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we have this... this all of these lies, you were talking about the press earlier, you know, the press, the idea is you want to keep the people stupid and contain like, like a herd of sheep. Well, the Washington Post and New York Times will do that for you. Yeah. And, you know, they, they sort of serve as the sheep dogs, mm. running around nipping at uh, any sheep that starts to get out of line. Mm. Uh, but the power of these, these media outlets is rapidly disappearing because no one is paying attention to them anymore. Well, the first of all, you've got a lower, a younger generation, as like under twenty-five, and they don't believe in anything, so they don't believe anything, <laughs> even what somebody tells them. This Tucson case is a good example of that kind of mentality. Exactly that. Mm -hmm. That's what you're getting. The Tucson thing is a certain portion of a population of this younger age population, which is defective, and a smaller f part of the total portion. Uh, is actually of the type of the Tucson guy. Hmm. And so you have a time bomb in this section of the younger population, but the whole section is, is inert in other ways. So you have a shrinking pop of the population which is actually thinking, are th capable of thinking. They just recite formulas blindly. And therefore, if we don't change this fat rapidly uh, by getting in a a sweeping change which corresponds to the mass strike interest. For example, if you have the Glass-Steagall, just take what I said before, what, what happens? The Glass-Steagall immediately means that we put the states back in business. The Hamiltonian principle of the Constitution does it. Huh? The Glass-Steagall effect. 
which means that we immediately put the police force, the fire force, the other things, the educational system, we put them back in place. Because the only reason they're not in place is because you know, maybe $20 trillion or something equivalent mm -hmm. of robbery of the U.S. for this fake, these fake things are the problem. So therefore, if we get rid of the waste paper, the toilet paper, or the used toilet paper, get rid of that, and then, this, then we can, with federal credit, we can bail out the state functions, which is what we are obliged to do by our Constitution, really. Uh, then we go with the high technology stuff on top of it, I like NWAPA and other of these kinds of projects. So we can rebuild first, protect the states, save the states from the Scott, you know, and, and other people like that, and Christie. Um, save the states, put them back in shape so they're functioning. Because that's the people. Our people live in states. Also some in mental states, but these, they, are we talking about the other kind of states? <laughs> so we, we put the states back to work. That's your population base. Now you go with large-scale projects, which are high-tech projects, which are science driver types of projects, which increase the productive powers of labor. You can invest that forever, as long as you have people who can create something, that you go ahead with that. There's no limit to it. And uh, that's what we have to do. If once we see that, then the thing comes under control because the mass strike movement then becomes the core of your moral support for the recovery. Now it's a resistance factor. They're saying, a certain generation is saying, we don't want to die like you old guys want to die. We're not, we don't want to die like that. We want life. It's like the teachers who were defending their students because the, the students, the pupils, depend upon the teachers to give them the access to the means of life. And the teachers are more moral than probably any other stratum in society right now in this respect. So that's what we have to do. Just, we have to rebuild the system by, and all we have to do is glass steagle will open the gates. And then we have to go to back to 1971 and we have to do what Roosevelt did. We have to have a fixed exchange rate system of credit systems, of sovereign national credit systems internationally, so that we can export and transport credit, long-term investment credit, across national borders as a cooperative effort among nations. For example, to, in order to take China and India, but take China first, in order to support the Chinese people, and they're, they're not, they can't support themselves now all by themselves because they haven't been able to reach the level of development to do that. They're doing the right thing in the overall direction. But then they're going to need a lot of mineral resources which can come chiefly from Siberia. Hmm? All right, therefore, we are going to have to help Russia hmm, develop the mineral resources in Siberia and related places in order to supply China, India, and so forth with the, those moral materials which are not really accessible to China and India. You have a very large, dense population in China and a dense population in India, more dense than in China. So therefore, we have to get, take the raw materials, minerals, in the northern part of Asia, which are, again, under the direction of, of Russia still today, by Russia's of the former Soviet Union, for example, so we have to do that for, in order to meet the demands of China and India and countries to the south. So that means we'll have to get international sources of credit to go in to enable Siberia to develop itself for this purpose, for the benefit of its neighbors to its south. And thus we need a system of a fixed exchange rate system so that we can have a 1.5% and 2% kind of borrowing rate on long-term credit, which will enable us to do this. So therefore, once we do what we have to do in the United States itself, we have to do as Roosevelt did with his intention for the post-war world, and that is to create a fixed exchange rate system so that we could develop the underdeveloped areas of the world on the basis of a credit system, not a monetary system. Fun. Yeah. Well, one of the obstacles we have is that a large percentage of the older, especially the older people in the United States, you know, the boomer generation and above, believe the fantasy that value, the value is in the money. 
and that the value is in all of these financial assets and they want to hold on to those things. And they, they're desperately trying to hold on to these financial assets that never were anything and are even less now. It's like, it's like a man going out to clothe himself in a transparent barrel. <laughs> yeah. And you, you know, you just have to, if, but if you let that go, if you just let go the idea that this, let go your fantasy and look at what real economic value is, then, then you can actually open the door to having a real economy and having real wealth. Yeah. But as long as you try to hold on to this funny money and call that wealth, you're just going to go bankrupt. You're going completely down the tubes. Well, they, people can do that. Even the boomers can do it. Uh, with some reluctance and creakiness about the whole thing. But when, you have, when you're losing everything, and the boomer generation is now losing everything, they, either, it's only their belief in the fact that they're not losing everything that protects them from the effect of realizing <laughs> that they are losing everything. Right? <laughs> the rise in prices, so forth. They have not been bestirred on this yet. yet. They haven't, they, you would think normally they would scream and jump up and down and do funny things that boomers do. Huh? But they're not. They're just sitting there like like toads uh, uh, on a toadstool or something. <laughs> just sitting there blinking, blinking at you. You say, what are you doing? They, they just banter by blinking at you like a toad in, on a stool. <laughs> but what happens is once you open the gates and show that there is a safe way in which to find a better way of living, they'll go for it. So I'm not too pessimistic about them. They certainly would like to have a real life rather than what they're getting now. But they don't have the guts to go out and get it for themselves. <laughs> so we have to help them. That seems charitable and fair. No, it's a people. You have to, you know, they may not be worth much, but maybe they've got grandchildren who are, you know, you've got to worry about. It. Well, you know, a lot of them used to be people. They yeah, used to become amazing, people again. <laughs> <Amazing>. <laughs> anyway, no, we, you just have to understand, you know, we are responsible. If you're a political figure, as I am, you have to accept the fact that you are responsible for the entire population. Not that you have the authority over the entire population, but you're responsible to do something about the whole population and its needs. You have to think in those terms. You can't think, I'm, well, this is what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in that. Now, if you're in politics and you're serious and you're competent and you have some morality, you think about the whole entirety of your people. You think about the people of the planet. You think about what they require. And you think about your responsibility to do something about what has to be done. And the problem is the boomers have lost that. But the younger generation, like the teachers in particular, the teachers who are out in Wisconsin against this crazy governor, this idiot, huh? They are showing that they care. They care about their students. That's the characteristic of those teachers. They care about their students. They implicitly care about society. They are responsive to the needs of society, not to some group here or some group there. Because when you make, when you make children, the education and care of children you're concerned. You're, th you're thinking in universal terms. And that's, the boomers have lost that. They've lost it. They've become alienated. They've gone through so many sex changes over the equipment <laughs> during the course of their life, I, don't, I think they have a little problem in orientation. But we have to help them nonetheless. They're lovable old, old creeps, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and we have to take care of them. Yeah. Well, we also have to make sure that no child ever has to to grow up like Prince Charles again. Oh my God, the poor kid, that <laughs> poor kid. You know, we have he to never had a chance. Yeah, I've never had a chance to be human. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks of himself as some kind of fungus that grows in the garden or something. Huh? And he keeps trying to go back in. I know. <laughs> Such is life. <clears throat> All right, Matt. I mean, we've just been getting some very exciting reports over even the last two days from especially the Midwest in Ohio and elsewhere where people really are going through a change in their thinking. Uh, Bill Roberts is reporting that uh, 
not only do you have people standing up and saying, hey, wait a second here, when did we change the subject away from Wall Street? When did unions and collective bargaining become the problem? I thought Wall Street was the problem here. And then on the, at the same time, you've got an openness to say, look, we're no longer going to just be on the defensive here. We're not just going to defend our, ourselves against some, some outside force. But it's time that we've got to go on the offensive. What have you got? You've got the solutions. What can we do? And there's a real process of, of, of rapid, rapid change. It's sort of an internal education of the, of the mass strike process inside itself. So we've got a lot of work to do. No, yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. well, you know, every, every election recently, the, the bums have been thrown out. New people have come in. People have hoped that the new people are going to do something right. The new people don't. They're just as bad or worse. Mm -hmm. So then they get thrown out, and new people come in. And it just, you know, the same cycle goes, and it, things just keep getting worse and worse and worse. And so, you know, the idea that the new people, now the Republicans are claiming a mandate. Well, they don't have a mandate for anything. They're only there because they're the people who weren't in power before. And, but, you know, they don't have any mandate from the people. And when they screw things up, as they do, you know, then everybody's reached the conclusion, okay, it's time for something different. We can't just keep going through these election cycles. We have to change. Well, boy, these, these people, these Republicans, are the children of boomers. They're the bad children. <laughs> and that's what they are. Be, be, if you think about them, this was the, tea, take the two Tea Party phenomenon. The Tea Party phenomenon was a very interesting phenomenon. It was a very bad one. It had no real moral structure to it. It had a, it had a reaction, reactive structure. And you see what happened when the Tea Party crowd got into power. What did you get? You got Rammed Paul, for example, the worst possible type, a real fascist, and a shrieking fascist. And these are the guys who are the so-called super liberals. The guys are all for freedom, freedom for this, freedom for that. And what are they now? What are they now doing? You know, showing you what their liberalism is. Mm -hmm. Their liberalism is fascism. Uh, Scott Walker's a fascist. Christie's a fascist. Rand Paul's a fascist. And that's typical of what we're getting there. And these guys are going to have to be driven out of office, or in, or, or checked in, uh, in such a way that they they're not able to exert their influence. And fascism is the philosophy of the empire, of the, of the financial elite. It's, it's the banker's party, if you will. It's the oligarchical principle. It goes all the way back to the oligarchical principle as struck between, Bab, uh, you know, between Philip of uh, Macedon and the Persian Empire. They struck an agreement between the landed internal Asian population of the empire and the, uh, the Mediterranean oligarchy. And this became known as the oligarchical principle. Now, forms of that existed earlier, but this agreement between Philip of Macedon and the Persian Empire was the crucial foundation for what became the Roman Empire. And you see that. What, what were the composition of the Roman Empire as formed in, 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 in Italy, essentially, the Isle of Capri? You see, you had the Romans, the Egyptians, which then were what they were, and then the cult, of, uh, the, the cult itself, which is Persia. And so therefore you had the oligarchical principle organized around a single region monetarist system that was and is the Roman Empire in its various incarnations to the present day, including the British Empire, the same thing. So the oligarchical principle, which says the, or the old system under the Greeks, it was called the gods, <coughs> as the Homeric gods, the gods and the people, the gods and the mortals. So you have people who consider themselves gods uh, in that sense, as opposed to the slaves and servants and so forth who are the people. And the gods must manage the people. It's like the, the thing of Aeschylus, he uses this symbol about the Olympian, uh, the Olympian Zeus. That Zeus 
forbids the people to have access to fire, which means the people are being condemned to be animals. Because without fire, man is an animal. No animal uses fire. Only man uses fire. Only the human mind uses fire willfully. And the oligarchical principle is that the power to use fire must be kept from the people, i.e. nuclear power. Huh? And that's the, that's the oligarchical principle. And that's the relic we, of the Roman Empire, which is now the British Empire, which we have to rid this planet of. <clears throat> Otherwise, if the time has come, we can no longer tolerate the oligarchical principle. And the, the Austrian school of economics, which spawned, you know, the von Hayek, von Mises, the, the libertarian party in the United States, the Rand Paul types. You libertarian. Know. Fascist. Yeah, this is fascism. And the idea, you tear down government, when you tear down government, what's left? What's left to protect the people? Nothing. The empire controls everything. Well, mankind will survive somehow, because mankind has a species quality, but this particular generation of mankind has got big problems. <laughs> well, it's a good thing we have a big solution. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's what I believe for a long time. All right, anything else, Matt? I think that's sufficient. Lynn? I'm fine. All right, well, we'll wrap it up then. All right, that's been this week's weekly, weekly report. Thank you, and we'll... Uh, See you next time.